talk to you today about true rest. You know, sometimes we can feel like we're getting pretty stressed out there, and I just think there's a lot of people really stressed. And even among us Christians, I think sometimes we get pretty stressed with things. And there's all sorts of ways of coping with that. Uh, one thing that I was just recently reading about is something that's called flotation therapy. And so uh, what they do is they uh, have you go into these uh, like flotation tanks. And here's a picture of one right here. And this is from a company called True Rest, actually. And the rest stands for uh, Reduced Environmental Stimulus Therapy. And so the idea is that they fill this up with Epsom salts, a thousand pounds of them, and you like are kind of almost weightless in there. You don't sink at all. You totally are, you know, up on the top of the surface. They heat it up to the temperature of just your your body, ninety-eight point six. Is well, that it? I have one. <laughs> or whatever, <laughs> whatever that temperature is that your body's at. Um, and then you like float in here for an hour with no stimulus, no, well they actually offer music if you want it, but they kind of encourage that you don't have even any sound or anything. But this is their way of uh, providing some rest. But I was thinking, well, one problem with this is this costs $100 a session. So you probably couldn't do this very often, I would think. At least I couldn't do, <laughs> do this very often. Um, and then also, once you like sit up, Gravity takes over again, right? You know, because they're, they're saying that this is part of getting out of gravity and that's what reduces aches and pains, makes you sleep better. You know, and you have to go back and face all the things that are making you stressed out, right? So, but God has uh, some great rest for us and Jesus has that great rest. Let's look at Matthew 11, 28 to 30. It says, then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. You know, and I just think it's wonderful here. Jesus doesn't charge us money for this. Um, Jesus doesn't make us do anything hard. Also, he, he tells you that you can come to him for rest. He doesn't go, well, why don't you see if you can handle this for a while, and then if you really can't, come back and, and we'll see what we can do for you. You know, which is something that a lot of people in the world might do. You know, kind of like, well, why don't you see if you can do it? You know, and then if you need help, we'll, we'll maybe see what we can, can help you with. Uh, but he promises that if you'll just come to him with those burdens, that he's going to help you and give you rest. And that word rest uh, in the original language is the word anapao, uh, which means to cease from any movement or labor and to keep quiet of calm and patient expectation. And I think that calm and patient expectation is really important there. You know, because I think sometimes we think to ourselves that the rest will come when the burden's gone, right? Like that's kind of what you're looking for. Like, let's get this burden off of me and then I will be able to rest. But it's that patient expectation while you're waiting for God to answer that prayer uh, that will bring the rest. It doesn't come, you know, it's in that space between the, the prayer and the answer that you get that. And we uh, can just trust him. You know, also he says to take his yoke upon, upon you and let him teach you. That's part of how this rest comes. And so here's a picture of two oxen in a yoke. And back in the days when they did a lot of this uh, type of farming, uh, they would put an older, more mature ox on the one side, and then the uh, younger ox was on the other side. And the mature ox took most of the, the load. Also, the mature ox understood what they were supposed to be doing, and the mature ox understood the commands of the plow driver. And so that was all teaching uh, the less mature ox, the younger ox. And as long as the younger ox decided to walk in step with the mature ox, everything was good. They were able to get the work done. It wasn't too hard for either of them. Uh, but as soon as that you know, young ox decided, hey, I'm not going to keep in step or I'm going to try to move off to the side, um, stuff got a lot harder when he would do that. You know, so this is a picture of us, you know, that we're yoked together with Jesus. And so he's taking the load. He's really taking uh, the great uh, weight of that load. 
But as long as we walk in step with him, we'll be able to navigate the things that we're going through in our lives, and we'll be able to do the things that he wants us to do. You know, so I think that's an interesting picture there of that. And it says that Jesus is humble and gentle in heart. You know, so you can trust him. He's not going to be too harsh. He's not going to give you too much, more than you can handle. You know, so we just have to follow him. And one thing that this week I just felt like God was talking to me about was that nothing, you know, that I need to face with Jesus is too little or too mundane to invite him into it and to ask him, you know, for that help and to help me walk in step with him through it. You know, I, um, like there was something I have, a, um, like a little health, a health thing. That's something that comes when you're older, you know, and I was just kind of living with it. I was sort of like, well, I'm older. These things happen, you know, but I felt like God was telling me, like, you need to be praying about it. You should pray for healing. Don't just go, oh, well, that's, <laughs> that's just part of your age. You know, so I kind of thought, okay, yeah. and how many other things in my life am I doing this? I started, after I noticed that one, I started noticing a few other things. And I was like, I never pray about that. Um, I should pray about that. I need to invite Jesus into it. You know, so I just want to encourage you this week to, you know, think about that. And think about also, you know, are you out of step with him? Too, you know, if there's something that's really hard, could it be that you're kicking against the yoke and try, trying to not stay in step? Possibly. I'm not saying necessarily it is, but it might be something to look at. And so I just wanted to encourage you with that for this week. And as we get ready to give, let's just do it out of thankfulness to him for everything that he does for us. You know, that he's got that amazing love and he died for us. And so let's give with thankful hearts. We've got some electronic ways up on the screen. But I'm going to pray over the offering and the prayer requests. And then uh, Lonnie and Max will receive those. Well, dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for all that you do for us. We thank you that you offer us rest. You offer to take the load and to really just guide us in everything. And Lord, I pray that you just help each of us just to remember uh, to even ask you into everything. And I pray that you just remind us, you know, any time that we aren't, uh, that, it's, that it's time. That's probably the first thing we should do instead of waiting until we've hit, hit the wall. So I pray, Lord, that you would help us with that. And Lord, I pray that you would use the offerings that are given today to build your kingdom, you know, to draw people in this neighborhood to you, Lord. We want more and more people to come to know you uh, because you're just such an amazing father, Lord. And so we pray for that. I pray that you bless each one who's giving to, Lord, that you would meet their needs as well as they give. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so Lonnie and Max will come receive the offerings and the prayer requests. And while they're doing that, I have just a few announcements for us. One is uh, the Women's Spa Evening. Um, if, if you're signing up, I need to know today uh, for that, but it's looking like that's going to be a great time. It'll be at the Aveda Institutes, and there's actually a slight change in time. Uh, they want us there at 5.30, uh, but they also don't want you there early. That's another thing, because their last class ends at 5.15. So, um, so if you show up early, they won't have any space, and also even the parking lot might be full. So, <laughs> so come just on time, and we will have a great time with that. And then number two here is Freedom in Christ. Uh, we're getting near the end of that study. You know, but each week is its own unique topic. You know, so if, even if you haven't been coming, I would highly recommend that you, that you come. You'll get something really great out of it. And we have dinner at 5 p.m., and then we do the study. So that's a great thing. And then finally, on Wednesday, we've got Hop Cafe here from 7.30 to 9. And that's a, a great time. I'm not normally able to come because I, um, I work somewhere else. Uh, but those who come, I hear they have a great time. Yeah, and you're meeting a lot of people from the neighborhood. So. Um, so it's just a chill time here. You can come, talk, get prayer, you know, have a little bit of breakfast. And so that's a great time. And with that, I will bring up Pastor David. And uh, Nancy is just a really good Bible teacher. Yes, she is. She's my favorite. Of course, I'm a little biased. But uh, it's good to be with you all. You know, when we talk about things like she mentioned, you know, Hop Cafe, and uh, what we did on Friday with the outreach, it's just, 
is much about being with all of you and the time that we spend together. And that's what makes it contagious with the body of, you know, the people in the, in the neighborhood. They're like, I like those people, they're nice. We heard that a few times. They, they're really nice people. So over time, you know, they're gonna start coming to other things, but it's a love that we have for each other. Amen? Amen. So today, we're gonna talk about true freedom. In other words, what do we do with our freedom? We sung about our freedom, we're glad. We know what God took and has taken us from and what he's brought us out of. And he who's forgiven much has great gratitude, right? I know in my life, I didn't deserve his forgiveness, certainly. I was leading other people out of freedom into chains. And I look at that, and Paul says, you know, even though he was trained in religious instruction, he says, actually, I'm the chief among sinners. Are you kidding me? I practice religion, but I don't practice love. So, true freedom. In 1 Corinthians 10, 23, through 11 through, and chapter 11 through 1, in writing these words to the church at Corinth, Paul is always writing a church. Have you ever noticed that? And so if he was writing us, he might say, Paul was attempting to recalibrate their values and their priorities. And sometimes we need that, right? We need a recalibration of our priorities. We get a little bit off kilter. You know, we need to be calibrated. Uh, sometimes you use a, a, um, a, a, a torque wrench to calibrate, you know, the pressure that you're supposed to put on a screw when you're fixing something uh, so that it doesn't get loose on you. And, you know, we don't want to get loose with our love. You know, we don't want to get off kilter. We don't want to get, you know, back into religion or anything like that. And as Paul is writing, as a church family, the Corinthians had become marked, not by the re religiosity thing, but by sin, division, pride. What is division? Division is, is a, uh, a separating of the actual vision. So you want to know what the vision is, but you don't want to jump in there and cause a separation of that vision, right? Or the direction of that we're going. So when he says division, that's what that's about. Pride. You know, sometimes we come to our own defense where we need to let God come to our defense, don't we? Amen. And they had lawsuits against one another. I don't know, maybe they had Frank Azar in the congregation, I, I, but I don't think he was back then. I mean, he's pretty old. Um, but lawsuits against one another. Personality cults. It was kind of like, a, um, you know, I like these four people, but I don't like them. And they, you know, hey, you know, you could be saying, I sit on the sanctified side of the church. They sit on the unsanctified side of the church. That was a joke when I was coming up. My friend of mine told me, told me that as a joke. He said, why do you sit on that side of the church? That's where all the sitters are. You should sit on the sanctified side. It doesn't matter, right? 1 Corinthians 10, 23 says this. All things are lawful. That is morally legitimate. Permissible. In our society, a lot of things are permissible. Marijuana is permissible, but is it beneficial? Mushrooms are lawful, but are they extremely beneficial? And we're altering our minds in some cases, right? We're supposed to have the mind of Christ. But not all things are beneficial. They're not advantageous. We've got to consider that. Is it beneficial? Is it advantageous? All things are lawful, but not all things are constructive to the character. Amen? What happens to my character when I get involved? What, what if I overeat? My character becomes kind of lackadaisical. You know, I feel kind of sedated, right? But he's talking about these things that we do need to be edifying to the spiritual life around us. That we're building one another up in the spirit. What does what our conversation? What does it entail? Does it build up? 
Does it lift another person up? We want to consider that. We can say whatever we want to say. Of course we can. We have lips and we have a tongue. But James talked about who can tame the tongue? Who can tame it? It's like a rudder. But it, 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 uh, a rudder actually steers a very big ship, doesn't it? And sometimes a rudder causes other people to get off course, doesn't it? And so we've got to be mindful of those things as we consider the Word of God. Paul says all things are lawful. He doesn't mean with an absolute kind of sense that you can just do whatever you want. Like, do what you feel. Like some commercials tell us. For instance, he's not implying for a moment that it would be lawful for him to commit murder or get drunk. Here again, we must understand the expression as referring only to matters of moral indifference. We've got a callous over our lives. I'm going to do what I want to do, regardless of the people around me. That is a thing might not result in building up a person in their most holy faith. Should I then be high-handed and demanding? of my own rights, or should I consider what would help my brother or my sister in Christ? And this is what Paul is leading into, and, and point number one, we must consider not only our own freedom, but what would affect other people's level of faith in the church, let alone the people on the outside that we want to minister to but in the church. Remember I started out by saying the fact that the most important thing is when we get together and we're excited to be together. Amen? Sometimes you don't get so excited about going to a family reunion, do you? If you shake a family tree, uh, the nuts tend to fall out, don't they? And sometimes when God shakes us up, we get a little bit nuts. And we need a course correction, we get a little bit loose. But as we continue on, Paul says what he's reminding them of what matters most. What is the most important thing? What is the thing that I need to consider? The Apostle Paul was reminding him of what matters most in 1 Corinthians 10, 24. Let no one seek only his own good, but also that of another person. Which brings up point number two. Freedom. We love that word, don't we? Though the truth of God's word reveals that life is not about indulging our own desires, but more about pursuing the desires of others, about pursuing that they get free also. And as we continue in verse 25 through 26, regarding meat offered to idols, he gives an example, and this gets kind of heady as we think about it, and we say, eating anything in the solid meat market without asking questions for the sake of your conscience. So he's saying, I don't necessarily want to know where that came from. And sometimes some of the food that we ate, if we knew where it came from, yeah, that would seriously bother us. But... You know, if we looked at the fact that before we ate chickens and they're wandering around in their own waste, it wouldn't be quite appetizing, right? It would kind of bother us <laughs> inside, right? So, but anyway, he's talking about forsaking the conscience. For the whole earth is the Lord's and everything that is in it. The whole earth is the Lord and everything that's in it. Bill Crowder says three things should enter the conscious mind of a Christian. First, the glory and honor of God must be paramount in our thinking. Does this bring glory and honor? Second, our example must not bring harm to anyone, but rather bring the grace of Jesus to all. Third, we must likewise need examples to pattern Christ's life for us. It's good to have examples. Brother, are you listening back there? 
Because you, you're talking a lot and it's bringing distraction. We want to focus on the Word of God. Point number three. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to give us the mind of Christ concerning what are, is your mind, uh, Lord, for building up his church? Have we ever stopped to think about it? God, has we ever come into church and we said, God, I want to know what your mind is for building up your church? The one, you know, that you died for. I want to know what your mind is on that. Point number four, if we put into practice his will for the church, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done, it will impact those around us in everyday life outside of the church. If we practice what we should do inside the church, then it becomes infectious to the people around us because you know what? We take the church outside the walls. Folks, we want to sing about Jesus in here. We want to rattle the windows. We want them to hear it. But we want our love to rattle the cages that they're in so that the doors would be unlocked and they would experience the freedom of Christ. Amen? Yes. And 27 through 28 tells us this. If one of the believers invites you to a meal at his home and you want to go and you want to eat, whatever has served you, do it without asking questions about its source for the sake of your conscience. Has it been fully refrigerated all this time? Would you do that? I mean, think about it. If you went to somebody's house and you say, you know what, I want to know what temperature that was stored at before you went. I want to know how long you cooked it for. Would, would, we, would we actually do that? Usually not. I mean, if we want to come back again, maybe. <laughs> but if anyone says to you, hey, look, I left this out of the refrigerator for a week. <laughs> um, or this meat has been offered to idols. Um, I want you to know, uh, before you came and tried to bless the meat, I actually, I stole it. It's really an offering unto the devil. And, and, and he told you that. And he said, Paul says, then don't eat it. It's a test. It's only a test. You remember there's a test of the emergency broadcast system. <laughs> remember that sound? Yeah, it still happens. Yes. He says, out of consideration to the one that told you, and folks, I want to tell you that sometimes people will test you in your life to see what your Christian response is. And it's for, for conscience sake, Paul says. Not only for ours, but for his. Now the Believer's Bible commentary puts it this way. Paul takes up another situation which might cause believers to ask, Suppose a believer invites you to dinner in his home. Would a Christian be free to accept such an invitation? Of course, right? Yes, if you're invited to a meal in an unbeliever's home, we we're talking about, you know, us and the family of God, and we go out to lunch sometimes, first Sunday of the month, uh, you know, coming up, well, once, once we get the stairs built and all that kind of stuff, we'll do more of a potluck and we'll kind of bring it inside because things are getting expensive on the outside. He said, you go into a believer's home and, and you're disposed to go. You're at liberty to eat whatever is set before you, asking no questions for conscience sake. Okay. If during the course of the meal, another Christian should be present who has a weak con conscience and he informs you the meat you are eating was offered to idols, should you eat it? No. Oh, bingo, 100%. You got it, brother. <laughs> if, you know, that happens, we shouldn't eat it. Not just because God's breaking our conscience during it, but what would it do to someone else that brought it up? Or the other guest that is at the dinner table. It's interesting. 
Food always goes with fellowship. You ever notice that? If you hang around church long enough, you might put on a little bit of weight. But some things you shouldn't eat everything. I mean, just because there's a box of donuts doesn't mean I need to eat three, right? No, you should not indulge because in doing so, you might stumble him and hurt his conscience. What, you know, what if I took the whole box of donuts and I took it to my seat? And that might cause somebody to stumble, you know, though it's all about you. I've got this, this dog at home. I call him Pugsley. Um, we call him Puggles for short. He gets into some pug crimes and all kinds of stuff around the house. He thinks life is all about him. You're merely a pawn in his spectrum. He's young. He's a puppy. He loves us. He shows us love at times, but other times it's all about Pugsley. Amen? It's all about Pugsley. And if you got a cat, you know it's all about the cat. Amen? <laughs> Neither should you eat if an unbeliever would be hindered or by my actions, right? From accepting the Lord through this action. Will it hinder someone else from accepting the Lord? There's the question. Amen? That's the key. Hmm. I need to think about this. Pause for thought. We need to ask in all situations, will my action cause others to turn away from him? Will my actions cause others? Whether it's gossip, whether it's discussing something in, and you're out to dinner and you're with someone else and you start talking about somebody that's not there, as if it would never get back to them. And maybe that would cause them then to stumble. We can come up with a hundred scenarios, but the point is, is it honoring to God? Does it lead someone else to Christ? We need to ask in all situations, will my actions turn others away from him? And for, as we continue in verse 29 through 30, and by conscience I mean for the sake of another man's, not yours, for why is my freedom of choice judged by another? We always say, you know, I don't want nobody to infringe upon my life. Or in the world today, the key word, I think, phrase is, we have to preserve our democracy. Ours. It's about me, my it's about my indulgence. That's what the world brings into our lives. It's not about anything to do with freedom. It's about myself, like my pug. And we don't want to operate like a pug in the world, amen? Causing pain or replacing pain and other things by another's conscience, another's ethics, another's sense of right and wrong. Have you ever stopped to study a person and see what's the look in their eyes? And that's going on. You know the eyes are a, a little bit of a window into the soul, ain't they? It's kind of hard to hide the expression. And the great thing about, you know, being a pastor is you see a lot of expressions. And it's such a wonderful thing. But my focus is not on the expressions in the faces or whether it's, I, I know whether it's received or, or someone is listening or not. But the problem, the, the, the situation is, Am I asking the questions? Am I getting blessed by the situation so that I would uh, bless others by my actions? And verse 30 says this, If I take my share of food with thankfulness, why am I accused of something for which I give thanks? Well, I, I got the whole box of donuts and didn't I give thanks for that? Oh, I was really thankful. I was so thankful, I ran them out to my car. Didn't I give thanks for that? Or I took the whole basket of cherries over on the table. Or Susan brought in some wonderful produce, and I decided I'm going to load it all into my bag. Oh, I'm thankful, though. 
But then the brother across the room is like, I really would have liked that zucchini. That would have made me thankful too. Amen? The thought is, what good will come of it? If we broke it down to the simplest thing, what good would come from it? That alone is an honor to God. What good would come of it in the relationship? Paul is about to answer this question. He anticipated that you might have that question today. True freedom is being grateful enough to serve others before ourselves and to be a Christ-like example. True freedom, knowing what it costs, what it costs the Lord for my salvation, gives, you know, the, the thing that I find most intriguing about life, when we had our front door on East Colfax, the difference, uh, we fed a lot of people, okay? We had a huge banquet table full of food. We made a lot of food. Many of you were there to experience that, some of you were not. But here, lo and behold, was an opportunity for thankfulness. Amen? Big table of food. Yet others would be so indulgent that they would take multiple to-go containers. Pile it on, brother. Oh, I'm thankful. Oh, I'm thankful for it. So thankful that we would find a food container in the parking lot full of food. It's like someone else could have used that. And didn't we think about but the, the true freedom lies in this, in our thankfulness. When I see people operate in thankfulness, that was very close to where they got free. Amen? When I am thankful, then I'm truly free. When I am thankful, now no longer do I just serve myself, no, I serve others. My thankfulness is contagious, amen? Thankful enough to be a Christ-like example, not by mustering it up, but no, it is something that has happened deep down inside. In 1 Corinthians 10, 31 through 33, so then, Paul says, so then, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of our great God. Oh, hallelujah. Let's do it all. For, don't be, don't, do not offend the Jews or the Greeks or the people down the street or the people next door or even the church of God. For God's sake, don't. Do it in church. Oh, this is the dress rehearsal before heaven. Amen? This is the practice session before we go out into the streets. Amen? But live, live to honor him. Have a life that is honoring to God is what Paul is saying to us. In verse 33, just as I please everyone in all things, as much as possible. He says, adapting myself to the interests of others. Have you ever thought to take time to study someone else? And what interests them? At times I marvel at Nancy and what she can do. And when I, I was studying the way she was teaching and preaching the word, and I thought, man, that's really awesome. And I know the time that she puts into being in the Word and the time that she puts in the presence of God. And it causes me to also, when I study that, to honor more, to give more honor. Amen? And as I look at another person and I really see the attributes and the <laughs> gifts that God has put in them, and I begin to look at them in a different light, I say, you know what? I appreciate you. 
I appreciate you so much that there's one donut left and I'm going to split it with you. Amen? Just to put it mildly. Actually, let's share the zucchini. We'll cut it in half, okay? Right? Not seeking his own benefit, but that of many, so that they will be open to the message of salvation and they may be saved. That they may be saved. So true freedom is to seek the freedom in Christ that others desperately need. And then finally, our final verse today, Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Look for godly examples around you. Look at their reactions to the same situation that you're about to face. Watch the leaders in the church around you and let their example give you a pathway into a walk which is true freedom. I pray, God, that we could be an example, Nancy, of true freedom. I pray that our elders and the people that surround us, and our overseers of the church, the board of overseers and the board, I pray, God, that they would be an example for others to walk in a true path of freedom. And finally, let's review. Let's review. We must consider not only our own freedom, but what would affect people's level of faith. Where are they at right now? Am I studying them enough to know that? Freedom through the truth of God's word reveals life, not just about indulging our own desires, but about the desires of others. We need to ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, give us a mind, the mind of Christ concerning building up his people and his church. Oh, Holy Spirit, give us such a mind that we would receive it today in this service, that we would move into a new and truer freedom. If we put into practice his will for his church, it will impact those around us. It'll be so contagious. Everyday life outside the church, they would say, look at, look what's happening over at House of Purpose. Oh my God, I need that. Amen? That our love is spilling out into the parking lot in all that we do. We need to ask in all situations, will my actions turn others toward Jesus or away from him? True freedom is being grateful enough to serve others before ourselves is a Christ-like example. True freedom is to seek the freedom in Christ that others desperately need. All they desperately need. Eternity depends on such things. Watch the leaders in the church say, I want to walk in true freedom. I'm willing, Lord, to preach myself into the altar call today. The message is not just for the church. It is for us. It is for the leaders. It is for the leaders. It's for you, chaplain, in the prison. It's for whoever can hear this message as it's transmitted. Psalm 51, 6 says, Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being. And it is hidden in the hidden part of my heart, you'll make known wisdom. Let's pray. Pray with me today as I pray. Lord, I want to heed your call to true freedom. Convict me about how I act towards people in your church. Help me, Holy Spirit, to inspire a faith response in those I encounter. By my example, let true freedom be a means that points many to Christ. All right, praise God.